Good morning, Saints. Good morning. Uh, we're here at uh, Wings of Life in Mobile, Alabama. Amen. I'd rather be here than in the best jail, best jail in the South, wouldn't you? Amen. I do have a couple of handouts. The one that I've given you is on the, the seat where you are, and it's the first three chapters of Judges, the book of Judges. And Gary and I, are, we're attempting to work through the Old Testament, starting at the book of Genesis and work right on through the Old Testament and talk about different personalities in the Old Testament. You'll find that the Old Testament really is the history book and it's loaded with history. And those people's names and lives became examples that are carried through into the New Testament. So we're talking in the, about uh, some incidents and some circumstances in the book of Judges. And uh, in the book of Judges is a list of judges. They were like uh, sheriffs or regional um, policemen, but they had a lot of power and God was behind them. And I've got a list of the judges here, but I didn't hand it out, but I'll just run through them and you can just repeat them after me. Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech, Toler, Jair, Jephthah, Ibsen, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, and Samuel. Now y'all want to, let's repeat these now. Uh, well, anyway, I've got a list of the names of these judges, and I'm just going to put it up here for any of them that are just dying to have something to memorize. Well, there's some unusual names. Unusual names. But these people ruled and reigned, so to speak, in the Israel for about 520 years. So, in and out, and the book of Judges is a story about their lives and different things about them. And uh, that's what I'm supposed to be focusing on today. But, of course, I'm big at reviewing and giving background information. And, of course, we've got the first uh, three chapters of Judges here. But I want to go over some things that we talked about last time. And... Uh, the first thing I almost always say when I have a class is that learning is a process that produces in knowledge, in attitudes, and in behavior. Learning is a process that produces change. Let's all say change. 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 In knowledge. knowledge. That's what's in your head or supposed to be in your head. Mine sounds a little empty this morning for some reason. In knowledge, in attitudes, that's your heart, and that's your seat of your feelings, feelings. And we talk about our feet and our hands. This is where we work. So what's here is often translated into here. We think of something, we go out and we cut the grass. We think of something and we go to the table, we eat our food. So knowledge, feelings, and we say, I liked my food, I didn't like my food. So there's feelings in life and then there's action in life. And you need to be, in order to be a fully functioning individual, you need to have all this working together. The thinking, the feelings, and the action. Sometimes we get this and this separated. We're doing things that are not very functional and thoughtful. And we get, as we say, divided and discompooperated and uh, the future. But there's always hope with the Lord. Let's just put our hands up and say, Lord, Lord. we know that there is hope with you. Amen. 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 All right. So, knowledge, thinking, feeling, behaving. You work at uh, the book of Joshua is talking about that 
God was changing the way he dealt with the people and going to a new type of government, so to speak. Hopefully, for a different kind of way of doing governance. And it's not easy when you change things. We've got a lot of stuff trying to attempt to change in our country right now, and it's very difficult uh, what's going on. Now, uh, God is trying to help the people as they have been in the desert, wandering in the desert. And every morning, what they do when they got up? Every morning, they went out, and what they do? They picked up on the ground. What was that? They picked manna. picked up manna. God sent bread every morning. They just went out, picked it up, from the manna to the corn of Canaan. Now, how many would prefer corn over bread? Well, you say I make corn bread. <laughs> How many like cornbread? I like yes, cornbread. Well, anyway, from manna now to the corn of Canaan. And who planted the corn? They the bread every morning. And the first time that they ate the old corn, which was corn that's planted around the garden, when they ate the first corn in Canaan, the, the manna stopped showing up. It was none on the ground. So when they ate the first corn, and whose corn was it? It wasn't their corn. It was the Canaanites' corn that they had raised and worked for. So God is doing everything he can to try to help these folks. And he gave them houses that they did not build. He gave them uh, food that they did not plant. He gave them roads that they did not build and bridges to get over the creeks and cities and towns, God just gave them everything. You think God was out to try to help them? How many believe God was trying to help them? You know, one thing you never want to think is that God is out to hurt me and destroy me. Amen. The devil, one of the things he'll tell you, God's not on your side. I'm the one that's going to you. I got some goodies for you. And I... Don't you believe that? He'll take me to hell. But God's on your side. Don't ever get the idea that God's out to get me. Some people think that God, God's really out to help you. You say, well, he took me to the hoorah patch. And I mean, he took me to the woodshed and spanked the living daylights out of me. Maybe that's the best thing could ever happen is when God disciplines you. So God is trying to do something for these folks. And he gave them food and road and bridges and cities. And what happened? What was the attitude of the people that they were going to possess? I got to looking at this in Joshua, the second chapter. It talks about uh, there was there's a story about one of the first people, Jericho, city that entertained some Israelites that were coming to the land of Canaan, Canaan and her name was right on the wall of the city of Jericho. I've been to Jericho. I've seen the wall that ain't. What happened to that wall? You know what happened to that wall? When they marched around the wall and they marched around the road, the, the, the uh, wall and they shouted, what happened to the wall? Did you know it actually sunk into the ground? Because if had it fallen in a heap, they never would have been able to get into the city. And I've actually stood and I've seen where that wall went right into the ground. I've been there, looked at it. But anyway, there's this Rahab is hearing about these people coming. And everybody was hearing about it because God was... Waving a flag, so to speak. I'm bringing my people out of Egypt, and they're coming into Canaan's land. And what, God, what did God say? He said, you're supposed to chase out all those folks that's in those cities and eating those grits and eating that corn and, and building those bridges. You chase them all out, and don't you have anything to do with them? You, get, you send them on the road. Get rid of them. 
Well, uh, they didn't do what God said. But it said that Rahab, the lady that entertained the spies that went to check out things, uh, she said that we have heard about what's happening. We've heard about what God is doing. And the people in this town and the people in this, bridge, in this region are scared to death. They're shaking in their boots because they know that God has got a plan and he's bringing those people out of that desert and he's moving them our direction and if we don't get out of the way, we're going to get rolled over and steamed over. The Lord hath given you the land. Rahab said to the spies that had gone into Jericho to check things out, God's given you this already and your terror hath fallen on us. We're scared to death. And we faint because of you. This is what Rahab is saying about the word that was coming down the pipeline, so to speak. And Joshua 5, 1 says that their hearts melted. The people were hearing God has got his people and he's coming this way with them. And we better get out of Dodge. And it says their hearts melted. And it, another term is used in Joshua 5, 5, 1 is their spirit evaporated. In other words, they lost their willingness to defend themselves <laughs> because they hear these people are coming. When they're going to come? I don't know when they're going to come. So they're, and how are they going to go into a city and have cook with with clothes on their back, shoes on their feet, utensils, implements for the garden. They don't have anything. So what did God do? Here so he put along in the Egyptians' lives that they said, here, take everything we've got and get out of here. They spoiled the Egyptians. And guess what happened also? God spoiled the Canaanites. They, the Egyptians gave them clothes and everything they needed to hit the desert. The Canaanites Egyptians households and valuables. So God is doing everything imaginable to these folks. Now, if you ever get in your head that God is out to get, it's not a God thing. That's a devil thing. God's not out to get you. If you ever get on the wrong side of God, you're on the wrong side. And I say get on the other side of the street and never go on the other side. When you think God's out to get me. And I think about this place here. There's a lot of people that's praying, that's giving, that's working, that's providing stuff for this kitchen, that's, that's giving their lives to do what? To help us. Not to destroy us. And if you ever get on the side that, well, I ain't nobody and I didn't ever have anything and my tricycle had a flat tire. And, uh, I mean, when you get into that kind of mode, I can't help you much. You got to say, God is my God and the Holy Spirit's my help and I'm going to get a hold of God like Jacob got a hold of that angel that he wrestled with and he said to that angel, I'm not turning you loose till you bless me. That's what you've got to do. You've got to get a grip on God and don't turn loose. I used to have a bulldog named Caledonia and she didn't have much tail. She wagged her butt instead of her tail because she didn't have any tail. And uh, Caledonia, I'd pull a, a sack around the house. I had it on a rope and I'd run, a little old kid, you know, I was less than 10 years old. I'd run around the house. Caledonia had little short legs. Boy, she, had, she was a screw tail bulldog, that's what she was. And she'd run and I'd jerk that old croaker sack and every now and then she'd get her get a hold to it and I knew I was in trouble I remember one day Caledonia got a 
hold of my croaker sack that was on the end of my rope. And I had to go in the house to do something. And I just went over to the clothesline. I don't know. Y'all don't even know what a clothesline is. Clothesline pole. I went on the clothesline and I tied her up, hanging up. And she was hanging up in the air. And she just did doing like that. And when I came out after I ate my sandwich, she was still up there. That's the way you need to get a hold of God. Yes. Get your grip on God and say, devil, you go to the place you came from and I am going to get back with my family. I'm going to get some ideas in my head. I'm going to clean up my life and my body and I'm going to start walking straight. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And if you don't, say oh me. All right, I heard that. Now, Let's talk a little bit more about some of this thing that happened. Now, get your, get your papers out here. And here, let's read this bad story again. It's, it's, it's a sad story. And it says that verse 7 of chapter 2, that's about the fourth page in for you because I've got a lots of uh, pages there. So go down about the fourth page and you'll see chapter 2 or 2 up there. You see that? Got it, got it right there. Two is this way. This is two. That's three. That's four and that's five. All right, two. All right, it says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord. And Joshua, son of Nun, the king, and all the work which he had done, and the children that... Israel did what? What's that? Stupid. Yeah. Say the word stupid. stupid. Y'all not saying it very good. That's stupid. That don't, that don't, that don't make sense. That. No, no. And they bowed themselves and provoked the Lord. To, they got God mad. Well, it's about time God got mad, isn't it? But now God's a God of love and mercy. But is there a anger side to God? You better believe it is. There is an anger side to God. And it even says, I think on this next page or so here, verse 14, look at this. How, how mad did God get? And the anger of the Lord was what? Hot. Say it. Hot. God is. Mad. I don't know if you ever had your father get mad at you. Yeah. I, he used to grab me by this hand and I'd go around and around. I ain't going to do it no more. I ain't going to do it no more. I ain't gonna. But he had a belt chasing my latter portion. And I used to think but I'm glad that he spanked me because of something that I had done. I don't know if you had discipline from your parents. You know, we have it now that you don't discipline children. You just let them do anything they want to. Give them everything they need, everything they want. <clears throat> How many don't think that's all a good idea? Now, we could get into some really discussion here if we started talking about our families and what good we had and what bad we had, what worked and what didn't work and what I had, you know. Boy, well, there would be quite a discussion. We might reference it some, but we won't get maybe too far into that. But it said God's, his anger got mad, got hot. And he delivered them into the hand of the spoilers and spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of the enemy round about them so that they could not any longer stand before the enemies. It's one thing to get, for the devil to get his hand on you. That's bad. But it's worse for God to get his hand on you. I don't want God to get a hand of discipline on me. But he did. He's, he was hot. And another statement, I think it says it again down here. Let's see, another place. 
where God says, uh, oh, verse 8 of chapter 3, flip over a page. Therefore the anger of the Lord was what? It was hot. It was all kind of hot. There's uh, what we call adrenaline. And it's one of the chemicals that's floating around in your body. And, you know, when you, they say that I looked at that person and their face was red. And they were gritting their teeth. There was a dream but I knew that they were, and they, they were all mad about something. They've been really mad. They're really mad. They've never had somebody. And they're standing there. My mama used to come out the back door. We'd play and play and play and play. I knew Buddy I had to get to the house. And she used all three of my names. Mama would be. And I might not get the hot food. I might. So I've seen people that are hot mad. There's smoke coming out their ear. Their heads are flying. They're mad. They're hot. Did God have a right to be mad at these people? Think about it for you. Well, you know, they were disadvantaged. And they didn't have any money. And uh, their shoes were torn up and their clothes were messed up and all. Did God have a right to be mad at these people? Who had given them shoes? Who had put clothes on them? Who had put food in their bodies? You know, we're, you're in a world that focuses on the broken and the bad and the disadvantaged. That's the kind of world you're living in. But I'll tell you what, that's not what built bridges over the Mississippi River and paved the roads and paid for the houses, paid for this house that we're living in. It wasn't people that were focused on. Uh, my hand is a little bit sore this morning. I can't get up and work. I'm just going to lay in the bed and think about how bad it is not to have things like everybody else. Did something fall here this morning? My water fell. Wet my whistle. <laughs> now I don't. I don't want to get too hung up on this, but I grew up a world. I grew up in a different kind of environment than you did. I'm from another world almost. I grew up in the '40s. How many of us was around when the '40s were around? You was around when the '40s. <laughs> it's a different world. So don't get caught up into this. I ain't nobody and nobody loves me and I ain't got no money and I ain't got okay, no. Don't get into that groove. The world will run you over, honey. And it'll spit you out and stomp you. How many understand what Brother Summers is saying this morning? Am I being honest with you? Yes. Do you want me to be honest with you? Yes. You don't want me to play fiddle with you. You want me to be honest. All right. All right. Now, what happened? These people. Hey, this gets really rough this morning. I'm going to go a little bit further. It says that these people got into serious trouble. And they started to messing around with other gods. And I started a little study on gods, not capital G-O-D, that's that God up there, but G-O-D-S. You know there's gods floating around everywhere in this world today. I was in a taxi just not too long ago, and the guy had stuff hanging over his mirror, and it was some foxtails and some little old bitty things like this and a little thing with string around it and all. And I said, that's probably his God. 
And I remember when I was in Africa, they, the people would bring their wood on the back of the bicycle. Hey, they didn't have cars. The road was rough. And they'd tie wood from up in the country to take to the city of Cotonou to sell it and make, probably make 25 cents and probably dry, uh, ride on a bicycle for 25 miles with just a little old heap of wood. But what would do, they'd have to stop to get some food and they would take their food off the back of the bicycle and they would lay it down on the side of the road and they would get their bike and maybe uh, come back a little while to pick it up and they would put something on that pile of wood and nobody would touch it. And it was called a fetish. And it was like a little bitty bunch of feathers or, 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 or feathers strung, strung together with some little sticks and some little th cantations or some kind of little th trinkets. And they'd put it on that wood. And I'll tell you what, nobody in that country would touch that wood because they was afraid they would get some kind of a hit from a god or something. And that was Africa. And I just think about how crazy we are in this world today. We let some kind of little pile of feathers or something like that rule our lives. I don't want something like that ruling my life. I want the living God that is the God of all gods, that is God Jehovah, and I want the Holy Spirit directing my life, and I want the power of God's grace on my life and not be strung up around a bunch of handful of old funny things that, that people attribute to being divine and have powers. There's so much junk in this world today that's got people hogtied. But I'll tell you what. There is a God that's alive and he's in my heart today. And if you love Jesus, say amen. 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 Now, it said they served Baal, B-A-A-L, Baal. I got to looking up, and it means Lord, possessor, and it even means husband. They served Baal. And here's what they attributed this God as. Every track of land or ground owed its product and productivity to a supernatural being or Baal that lived there. So they believed that Baal was the god of productivity. How ridiculous can we be? It's not Baal that makes those seed to crack open and celebrate the name of Baal. And that word lascivious is a very powerful word. And it has to do with lowness, lewdness, wantness, and filthiness. And that was getting the lewd sex. Sexual, sexual acts. I mean, how crazy can we be? And there's all kinds of things that came. Now you think about that. We had a horse when I went to my cousin's house, and it was a little old silver Shetland pony, and uh, and we'd be bridling up the big horse, and the Shetland pony would come around. Boy, and if you watch, didn't watch out, and you'd bend over to pick up the sash or something that's to tie it for the saddle, that, that Shetland pony would hit you in the back and he'd take a plug of flesh out of you if you didn't watch it. He was a bad dude. And I thought about, I sure don't want to be kicked by this horse. The first time he tried to bite me was the last time he tried to bite me. Because I took that bridle that I had and me and the Shetland pony, we had a, a come on together meeting. And he never did try to bite me after I gave him some very strong correction. You said you shouldn't do that. I did. And I didn't get bit. And you don't use the bridle on him that way and he'll bite you. 
Now, I'm talking to your head this morning about the way we think. We think crazy. We think about things in the wrong way. And what we have to do is get our head straightened out. And what we think and what we feel and what we do has got to get together. Otherwise, if my head and my feelings don't cooperate together, I'm going to be turning my feelings over to somebody that's going to take my feelings and use them to destroy me. But I've got to have God's truth in my head and let my body and what was doing here in these lascivious worship was their sexuality was being taken and was being used and it became more important to go to do sexual acts than it was to worship the idol. And that's getting things all out of kilter. That's getting things all mixed up. Take advantage of my sexuality. My sexuality is one of the best things God ever gave me. One of the best blessings he ever gave me. And what do you think the devil would want to do to my sexuality? He'd want to steal my sexuality and have me to, to whore myself instead of walk right and do what's right. And the devil would take everything you've got, even the good things about you, and he will take them and he'll control you through that and destroy your life. And these people were bowing down to idols. It's crazy, isn't it? But they did it. Do you know some people that's worshiping idols these days? Say, I don't believe in idols. And I got to thinking, what is it that we consider to be idols these days? I had a car when I was a young man. I got to put this uh, ship in the shore here. I had a car, a 54 Chevy. I polished that thing, <gasps> polished that thing, cleaned it up, worked it up, fixed it up. I really worshipped my car. My car was my idol when I was 16 years old. 54 Chevy. Had four on the floor, three by the knee. You know, it'd run about 85 miles an hour downhill. <laughs> and and uh, some people have money as their idol. Money's more important to them than God. How many understand what I'm talking about? Some people have sports. Have you ever watched people on TV on Sunday uh, going to sports? And all the stuff they, y'all don't have TV around here. Do they let y'all see the news or anything like that? Well, I'm not going to try to change anything. But I know that, have you you've seen people go to sports events and how crazy they get all liquored up? I made a mistake one time of going to the Saints game and I was sitting in the cheap seats, the nosebleed section, you know. And everybody that was up there, there, there was a, like a metal wall behind us, and they'd get up there, and they'd beat on that wall and scream and holler. They didn't care what was going on down there, but they had these quarts of Ginny, you know, and they was about loopy out of their heads. And I mean, I was afraid they was going to wash me up with the, some of that stinking beer. But I said I'd never go back there again. But they were having a party. Some people party. That's their God. It's the party. Every weekend, they party. Do you think they care about God? No. The next weekend. And you can't make some people make sex a God. Some people make gambling a God. Some people make gaming a God. I got a, somebody I'm thinking about right now. Am I being honest with you? Yes. Now we say those people were crazy. To, watch, to, to worship that stone idol. Doing this kind of stuff today, and they're the blood as stupid as. I don't like that. I don't want God in my. Yeah. The God. He's got my. 
He's got my best interest in mind. Now, we got to close this thing up this morning. Now, this is, this is really a sad story when we start talking about idolatry and this kind of stuff. And it makes us feel like, I don't have no problem, but that lady sitting beside me, she's got the problem, you know. It's not me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer, but it's that guy sitting over here next to me, you know. How many say, I just can't wait to blame myself for doing wrong? That's not the problem. But it's, it's everybody else. You heard about that you know, well, that lives down there. It's always somebody else. I don't have no problems. I'm a saint, you know. My wings, see those wings sprouting out in the back there, you know? I got a halo that's so tight on my head, I know it hurts your head. 